February 15, 2019. FBI investigators arrested then 50-year-old Coast Guard Lieutenant Christopher Hassan, an acquisitions officer for the Coast Guard's National Security Cutter Program at Coast Guard Headquarters in Washington, D.C. The Coast Guard had flagged Hassan after he had used his work computer to access extremist websites and had conducted searches for topics such as civil war if Trump impeached, most liberal senators, and are Supreme Court justices protected. Investigators searching his home found several rifles, handguns, silencers, body armor, and over a thousand rounds of ammunition. They also found that Hassan had created his own hit list of individuals he had intended to kill. They also found his motivation. Hassan had been a neo-Nazi skinhead for the last 30 years. He was a fan of Anders Breivik, the Norwegian terrorist who killed 77 people in 2011 and had expressed his own fantasies of murder. In this episode, we'll be taking you into the world of extremism, something that isn't new to the military, but something that has taken on a new shape and a new priority for the DoD. Extremism isn't just happening behind the scenes, it's now happening center stage. And perhaps we're not as shocked as we need to be. I'm Rod Rodriguez. I'm Jack Murphy. This is Military Matters. Let Navy Federal Credit Union help you rebalance your priorities and take back control of credit card debt with their balance transfer offer. You'll save more with a low intro APR when you transfer your credit card balance from another lender to a Navy Federal credit card. Plus, with no balance transfer fees, you can choose the card that fits your lifestyle and be on your way to doing away with high interest credit card debt. 5.99 to 18% variable APRs based on product types and credit worthiness up to $1 cash advance transaction fees at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Check out NavyFederal.org for more information. Navy Federal is federally insured by NCUA. We opened this episode with a quick story of a neo-Nazi Coast Guard officer who would be prosecuted for the possession of illegal firearms, illegal silencers, and controlled substances. But the relationship between extremism and the military goes back even further than the 90s. Nathan Forrest was a Confederate Army general during the Civil War who would become the first KKK Grand Wizard. His status as a veteran of the Civil War helped him attract other Civil War veterans to the KKK. Fast forward to 1995, when 22 soldiers of the 82nd Airborne were linked to skinhead and extremist groups after three soldiers were charged with racially motivated murder of two black civilians in Fayetteville, just outside Fort Bragg. A small but concerning number of service members have turned to right-wing extremism, including neo-Nazi movements. Just last year, Army Private Ethan Meltzer was charged with conspiracy to murder his fellow soldiers in the 173rd Airborne. He was in contact with a group calling themselves the Order of the Nine Angles and the Neo-Nazi Rapewaffen Division. On January 6, a peaceful rally in support of President Trump exploded into a riot that stormed the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., shocking a nation as insurrectionists sought to interrupt Congress from certifying the lawful electoral votes of President-elect Joe Biden. Many of those insurrectionists were followers of QAnon, a conspiracy theory that has turned into a movement with aspects of it following white supremacy. So I wanted to understand the problem better from the perspective of those who were actually part of the problem. I wanted to know how patriotic young Americans get radicalized and brought into neo-Nazi movements. What makes them susceptible? What does the recruiting process look like? Why are these ideas still seen as viable by so many soldiers despite America's historical legacy with racism? Despite America's shock at recent events, these right-wing agitators did not appear out of thin air. And people like Shannon have been warning us about them for a long time. I was never um, officially part of any particular, you know, like I, there were like Hammerskins around and stuff, but I never officially like joined Hammerskins or any of the other organizations, but I was around a lot of them. That's Shannon Foley Martinez. She's a former neo-Nazi who was radicalized near the U.S. Army's Fort Gordon. She has since left the movement and now speaks publicly and warns about the dangers of white supremacy. And so pretty much my entire adulthood has been spent not just, you know, trying to figure out and understand how I ended up in the white power movement, 
especially a very like violent sect of the white power movement, but also really focused on how do I help human beings to thrive so that they never look to hate or violence. I wanted to know, how does someone get radicalized? For me, and and so this is this is nitpicky and sounds like sounds ridiculous, but I don't see that people get radicalized, they radicalize. That you know, I had agency. I made choice after choice after choice that built this world, this this echo chamber world mm-hmm. over the course of about six months to a year where my whole life was influenced and immersed in the white power movement, where it began to be, in my case, it was like a physical echo chamber where I only interacted with other people that were in the white power movement. It was the only music and reading material um, that I was consuming and over time, it was the only thing that I viewed anything happening in both my personal world and also the world at large that I, you know, I began to view everything through that particular lens. Shannon talks about having agency, but what drives someone in that direction to begin with? Was it an antisocial personality disorder? Was it something going on at home? What took her there? from the outside, everything looked fine, but it was incredibly, incredibly dysfunctional. And the way that I came wired was that, that there was a sense of instability and that I didn't really belong in my family. And, um, that, uh, I, the rules were always changing and I didn't understand how to navigate this space. And I didn't understand, you know, they were like, you should be perfect, but what perfection was, was never defined. And I didn't feel like I had the tools or skills to make any of that happen. I didn't feel seen and I didn't feel heard. I didn't feel like I had any real agency in my life, but I also had played a lot of sports and I had a lot of friends and stuff like that. So I still had other protective factors that were keeping me from dealing with all that in destructive ways. But then when I was 11, we moved from where I had grown up halfway across the country to rural Southern Michigan. And when I got there, that sense of like feeling like I didn't belong in my family expanded out into the greater world. But I did still play some sports and I had some friends and stuff, but they had all been friends their whole lives. And so there was this sense in which I really was kind of like an outsider. And then when I went to high school, I ended up going to a private high school across the border from where we lived in Michigan in uh, Toledo, Ohio. And there was a law that if you went to school, high school, and you didn't live in the state of Ohio, that you couldn't play sports. And I think it was like a rule originally set up for football and recruiting across the border, particularly like in Southern Ohio for football. But so for me, one of my like last lifelines was now severed. And then In addition to all of that, uh, at age 14, I ended up going to a party um, with some friends where I ended up being raped by two men. And they were white dudes. Um, A lot of times people, you know, people ask that. It's just, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't like I was raped by black men and then I became, you know, a, a racist skinhead or whatever. But that final set of, you know, violent trauma, you know, just, just, I didn't have any means of processing that. I didn't have anyone I could tell. Like I didn't have that relationship with my parents. And in fact, it was like, I grew up my whole life. It's like, if you were hurt or if you were sick, like my parents first response was very often just like, was to yell at you that they felt out of control and they felt powerless in situations. So you would, you know, and come in with, you know, your tooth chipped or whatever. And they'd be like, how many times have I told you not to play tackle football in the backyard? So I knew intuitively i absolutely couldn't tell my parents that they would yell at me and shame and blame me for the sexual assault that I had um, just endured rather than offering empathy, you know, cause I had, I'd lied about where I was going. I'd been drinking at the party and it's, I've actually had conversations with them in, in my adulthood about that. Like, so like, what do you think? And they were just like, well, you were kind of asking for it. So even knowing the rest of the story and how it goes or whatever, like there's still that, that sort of like victim blaming that is still like part of their response. Shannon had been raped by two men at the age of 14. She had nowhere to turn for help, no real friends, nowhere to turn at all, really. 
after that sexual assault happened, it's like I took all of that trauma and the trauma that I wouldn't even understand about my childhood that I had no idea about at that point, about the sort of like developmental trauma or whatever, and just like shoved it all down completely unprocessed. And we know that like unprocessed trauma doesn't dissipate, it festers. And in my case, it festered, as it does so often for so many people, into rage, rage that I didn't understand. I didn't have tools to process or even, you know, I didn't have any means to be able to even express that in anything even remotely holistic or pro-social way. And the angriest people on the periphery of the punk scene were the white power skinheads that were around. And I think that rage in me like really resonated with the rage that they displayed. And I really kind of like gravitated towards hanging out with them more. And, and they all always had each other's backs, you know, so there, they would be there, there would be fights all the time or whatever. And they always fought, but they always fought together. And I think that, that, that was very, you know, very alluring to me that I felt so deeply disempowered in my life, you know, that it was like, I can at least make people afraid of me. Like that felt something like empowerment to 15 year old Shannon. Shannon had found a punk music scene that perfectly represented the rage she felt inside. The other kids in the punk scene were misfits. They were moshing around full of angst and hurt. The punk scene in her area was also the skinhead scene, which eventually became her scene. You know, by that point, it's like I had enough exposure to know some of the tattoos and the symbology and the patches and the flags. And, you know, when we're talking about what people think when they think of skinheads, it's like, you know, haircuts. And I had like my skinhead girl haircut and my Doc Martens or grinders and my, you know, my white or red laces. And, you know, that there were basically essentially sort of like gang signs that identified us to one another. Shannon's group of skinhead punks wasn't just civilians, but also U.S. Army service members that she met within that scene there would be people who would rotate in or whatever. And so it was just sort of this continuous, they could find each other on base too. And so that was sort of a steady stream of folks after that. And we would get like, go to some punk shows and stuff like that. But, you know, I mean, that was at a time that was before nine 11. So it's like, I mean, even as a civilian, I could just go drive on base. Like I could just go hang out with them or whatever uh, on base. Americans have a vision of their military. And in poll after poll, the American public is beyond generous in their support. We have this vision of our soldiers, of young patriotic men and women that are out there doing the right thing. I was curious about how a soldier gets radicalized and how do they radicalize themselves? How does that process happen for a service member? Number one, we have like an all volunteer military at this point. And some of that is going to reflect people who are there because it's something that they actively really want to do, that this is either part of their family or something that they think is something that is patriotic or is their duty or to eat further training or to get college money or, you know, or whatever. But there is also going to be a large subset of people who are there either because their choices were to go into the military or go to prison or to jail. And there's going to be people who are there who are there because they really didn't have any other options, that they don't have money for college, and that they don't really have any future that they can see for themselves, and that their home life is not awesome and that there's a lack of opportunity where they're coming from. And so you, I mean, and I think that's probably a pretty significant portion of the military at this point, that it's people who are going in because they don't, they feel like they don't really have any other options. So does this mean that young soldiers undergoing the basic training, military indoctrination and shaping process are more open and exposed, uh, more susceptible to additional elements being tacked onto that, such as radicalization elements? Yes, I think it absolutely does. So it's like we know from research that there are things like a lack of agency, people who are looking for a place to belong. They're looking for a sense of meaningful connection to something greater than themselves. They're looking for a sense of empowerment. They're looking for a sense of a cohesive identity. And those are all of the things that basic training and training in the military is designed to like give you so that you can take on the sense of purpose 
and the identity of your branch of service and that these are all things to build cohesion and to make effective troops. But they also happen to be overwhelmingly the same things that leave people vulnerable to finding resonance with the radicalization process into violence and hate-based uh, worldviews and stuff. So um, it only takes one charismatic leader who had these beliefs coming in to effectively just be an agent of radicalization for a whole bunch of people that they come in contact with because they're already in the process of having their identity stripped down and la- losing their agency. And often, like I said, it's like, so a very, you know, a, a pretty significant subset of the people who are coming into the military are coming from home lives that are not very awesome, have layers of trauma that they have endured. Don't have, you know, I've already have a lot of the things that make them sus- more susceptible in the first place. They don't have any support systems you know, they're separated from the communities and the support systems that they had up until, you know, up until now. And so it becomes sort of this perfect storm. So if you have one charismatic person that brings these beliefs in with them, that they can be the agent of radicalization of just so many. And there's also the dynamic too. And I don't know how true this still is because my experience, you know, is many years ago, but that just much like in prison, that a lot of the community building that happens falls along racial lines. And my experience interacting with the military was that that was true as well, overwhelmingly, that that there was sort of like self-alignment inside in the ways that people socialized that fell along racial lines. And so Black troops would hang out with other Black troops and the Latino troops would hang out with other Latinos and the white guys would mostly hang out with other white guys. And then, of course, there were like there was some crossover with some of the people in some of the groups, but pretty much fell down like racial lines in terms of socializing. I wanted to know if Shannon had any sense of how many soldiers had come into the army as neo-Nazis versus how many got radicalized after they were already in. Of those 30, there were probably five or six that came in that way, a couple of whom because they were facing charges and they were given the option of military service or jail. And they might have had like some exposure, but the rest like definitely amplified, if not completely radicalized since enlisting. When we return from the break, Shannon shares with us what she saw the military do to curb extremism and how she found her own way out when we return. Are you carrying a credit card balance after the holidays? Trust me, we've all been there. Let Navy Federal Credit Union help you rebalance your priorities in 2021 with their balance transfer offer. You'll save more with a low intro APR when you transfer your balance from another lender to a Navy Federal credit card. Plus, with no balance transfer fees, you can choose the card that fits your lifestyle and be on your way to doing away with high interest credit card debt. You can even manage your balance transfer safely and securely through the Navy Federal mobile app or online. 2020 came with a lot of unpredictability. And if you're looking to save more and take back control in this new year, transferring your balance to a Navy Federal credit card is a great first step. 5.99 to 80% variable APRs based on product types and credit worthiness, up to $1 cash advance transaction fees at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information. Navy Federal is federally insured by NCUA. Shannon was deep into the skinhead punk culture around her, and she saw several service members floating around those same groups. I asked her if she had seen the military take any steps to crack down on the extremist activities. Oh, no, not at all. No. That might be hard to believe at first. But consider that in 2009, Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano apologized to veterans groups that were offended by a department report that inferred war veterans could be sought out for recruitment by right-wing extremist groups. Not only did Napolitano apologize for the report, she disbanded the committee that wrote it. This should give you some idea of how politically sensitive the topic of extremism in the military was around that time frame. I wanted to know what Shannon thought we should do to engage this white supremacy subculture in the military. The military, of course, isn't like a monolith, right? I do think that having a greater understanding of how the 
troop training aligns with the same vulnerabilities that open people up to being radicalized into hate or violence, I think that that is something that should be addressed and discussed for sure. I do also think that because we're all, we, we also know that beyond just like active duty military, that there are three percenters and other, I mean, other groups that are other militia groups and that, that we're, we're also talking about a whole lot of veterans that are part of these groups and militias and movements. And so some of it, of course, is, I think, ongoing addressing of trauma uh, is something that is good, not just for our troops individually as human beings, but also for us as a society. I think also really just identifying that it is in fact a problem that we're so bad at this as Americans at large. We were just like, oh, well not, you know, and it's like, okay, we, this is a problem for the military. This is a problem in our veterans. This is a problem in active duty military. This has been a problem for a long time. And even if it's like, hey, we're not totally sure how we're going to deal with this, but just this admittance, like this is going on, this is happening, this is a problem that to me, like that is the first step in ever getting to any sort of addressing of a problem. We have to first say like, we have a problem and that we're going to commit to doing everything that we can. Even if we learn through some failures and missteps along the way, we're going to not see that as failure. We're going to see that as, you know, as strategic retreat in order to get, gain a better position to, you know, when, when we, when we go forth again, that learning through those failures can be just as important. But the first step is saying like, Hey, we have a problem and we have to address this, that we are not only just admitting far right and fascist and white power people into our ranks, but we're actually training them and then creating conditions to amplify their radicalization. Then, you know, they experience trauma while they're in here, which is an agent of even further radicalization as they leave. Just getting to the beginning of that and saying, we have this problem. And then, you know, I mean, there's so many amazingly intelligent and smart and innovative and creative people that are part of um, the military. I feel absolutely certain that this is something that we could holistically address. Shannon left the world of white supremacy behind and is today raising a family with a very different set of ideals than what she grew up with. I asked her if she has seen service members also change course. Did they find a way to de-radicalize? I was actually dating a guy uh, who was active duty while training for reserves when my parents like ended up kicking me out and I didn't have anywhere to go. And luckily I had met his mom and her younger sons uh, while uh, he went home for Christmas exodus. And I, I had actually gone to visit him and she said I could go live with her which was a very great thing for me because that was really where I began, you know, my echo chamber now started to be broken and um, she took me in and, you know, she didn't have any reason to take me in, but like genuinely treated me like family, those younger you know, his younger brothers, you know, treated me like family. And we started to do like regular people stuff, like throw the football out back and go camping and hiking and fishing and stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, like this is like what people do. And that was like sort of the beginning of my off-ramping process. This like broken and twisted need set that I had began to be actually met. Like I began, I began to, I began to actually have, um, you know, people who saw me and heard me and um, accepted me and where I belonged. And I didn't, I didn't have to espouse any ideology or anything to be there. And so when he finished up his training, he, um, he came back and he was still like part, you know, he was still in a reserve unit or whatever, but he and I basically de-radicalized, walk away from the movement at the, you know, at the same time. And then I would circle back around to a handful of the people that I met while I was in who I would find out had also left the movement. A couple while they were active duty and a couple more that after they had already left. Wow. It's not too often you hear about these stories from someone who actually lived in it. I think it just means so much more to all the listeners out there to hear this kind of material directly from Shannon, rather than just listen to me offer opinions or do research on it. This was an incredible insider's view of white supremacy in the military and how it works. 
It was really eye-opening, especially when you consider how deeply connected the military culture and extremism has been throughout American history. You talked about extremism through the lens of white supremacy, but I can tell you that I have friends that ascribe to the Q movement and are heavily invested in the Stop the Steal ideology that are not white supremacists. They're not even white, in fact. How do we tie this into folks who aren't aligned with that kind of extremism that we have talked about in this episode? So when it comes to folks who are not uh, necessarily Caucasian becoming extremist or, or being radicalized, I think there are a couple of different ways to look at it. Uh, a lot of us now are talking about QAnon, which is seen as a, a so-called big tent conspiracy theory. Uh, what makes that interesting is it doesn't necessarily only draw in white supremacists. It also draws in anti-vaxxers. It draws in uh, 9-11 truth people. It draws in uh, people who think there is some sort of international cabal of pedophiles secretly, secretly running the government. So, I mean, in my own experience, I've known Hispanics who have become neo-Nazis. I know I was an acquaint. I had an acquaintance who was Puerto Rican, and all of a sudden, this guy was posting on social media about how great the Waffen SS were, and that they were really the good guys of World War II. I, and he wasn't doing this to be ironic. He wasn't doing this as a joke. Like he had really gone over to the other side and believed that the Third Reich was a great thing. Um, so I, I'm at a bit of a loss to explain it, but I think that some of the same factors that drive white people to neo-Nazism can also, uh, push Hispanics in that direction as well. Uh, those feelings of alienation, those feelings of not having the answers to what's going on in the world and not having a support system. Listeners, what do you think about Shannon's conclusions and thoughts about reforming the military? and how it addresses trauma as a path to de-radicalization. And what do you think about Jack's conclusion about the non-white supremacist aspect of extremism? Shannon's story got us both thinking about the checklists that we have to complete prior to deploying, where we had to be green on med pros, on dental, and our life insurance, and so on and so forth. It all had to be updated before we could go out the door. What if one of those green checks had to be mental health? This is something I could see not only curbing extremism, uh, but if we did these sorts of normal mental health screenings, it could also help address PTSD and make soldiers and families more resilient, as well as create a better end state for veterans, uh, meaning that it would set them up for success when they get outside of the military as well. Sadly, as long as there's war, there will also be trauma. And from listening to Shannon's point of view, one can't help but note that extremism in the ranks is something we'll never be able to completely address. Should soldiers have to routinely go through these kinds of mental health checkups, not simply to purge extremists, but in order to take better care of the troops and address their combat experiences across the board? Send us your emails to militarymatters at stripes.com or leave us your thoughts on social media. We're on Twitter at StripesMMPod. You can reach Jack directly on Twitter as well at JackMurphyRGR and myself at RodPodRod. I'm Rod Rodriguez. This was Military Matters. This episode was written and produced by Jack Murphy with additional assistance from Rod Rodriguez. Executive produced by Joe Fleming. Go to Stripes.com, use promo code podcast and get 50% off your digital subscription. That's 50% off your digital subscription. Go to stripes.com, use promo code podcast. Make a plan to do away with high interest credit card debt by transferring your balance to a Navy Federal credit card. With a low intro APR and no balance transfer fees, you can pick the right card to help you save more. 5.99 to 18% variable APRs based on product types and credit worthiness up to $1 cash advance transaction fees at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Check out NavyFederal.org for more information. I'm Rod Rodriguez. I'm Jack Murphy. We'll see you at the next episode.